Ernest Nagel, Defending Atheism, Video 3. In this video, we're going to cover Part 4, which is the teleological argument, or the argument from design. Video 1 covers Part 1 and 2 of Defending Atheism, and the first two paragraphs of Part 3, which includes the cosmological and the first cause argument. Video 2 covers the rest of Part 3, which is the ontological argument. Video 4 will cover the last two paragraphs of Part 5, which is the argument from religious experience. And Video 5 will cover Part 7, Nagel's Positive Doctrine of Atheism. To begin Part 4, the next argument, called the argument from design, is different in character, for it's based on what purports to be empirical evidence. One variant of it calls attention to the remarkable way in which different things and processes in the world are integrated with each other, and concludes that this mutual fitness of things can be explained only by the assumption of a divine architect who planned the world and everything in it. For example, living organisms can maintain themselves in a variety of environments, and do so in virtue of of their delicate mechanisms which adapt the organisms to all sorts of environmental changes. There is thus an intricate pattern of means and ends throughout the anim animate world. But the existence of this pattern is unintelligible, so the argument runs, except on the hypothesis that the pattern has been deliberately instituted by a supreme designer. And it continues. If we find a watch in some deserted spot, we think not that it came into existence by chance, and we don't hesitate to conclude that an intelligent creature designed and made it, but the world and all its contents exhibit mechanisms and mutual adjustments that are far more complicated and subtle than those of a watch. Must we not therefore conclude that these things too have a creator? So. From this, we can draw an argument that might look something like this, and I think that we're familiar at least with the form of this. Because of its complexity, we need not hesitate to conclude that a watch was deliberately created by a designer. In the second premise, the world resembles a watch, but is even more complicated. Premise three, like effects have like causes, and so the world must have also been deliberately created by a supreme designer. Now, let's consider Nagel's objection to this argument. The conclusion of this argument is based on an inference from analogy. The watch and the world are alike in possessing a congruence of parts and adjustments of means to ends. The watch has a watchmaker, hence the world has a world maker. But is the analogy a good one? Let us once more waive some important issues, in particular the issue of whether the universe is the unified system such as the watch admittedly is. And let us concentrate on the question of what is the ground for our assurance that watches do not come into existence except through the operations of intelligent manufacturers. The answer is plain. We've never run across a watch which has not been deliberately made by someone, but the situation is nothing like this in the case of innumerable animate and inanimate systems with which we are familiar. Even in the case of living organisms, though they're generated by their parent organisms, the parents do not make their progeny in the same sense in which watchmakers make watches. And once this is point is clear, the inference from the existence of living organisms to the existence of a supreme designer no longer appears credible. So, to sort of summarize Nagel's objection, organisms are not made in the same way that watchmakers make watches. So premise three, right, that like effects have like causes is false. A watch and the world are not similar enough to properly support an analogy between the two. Now, another objection that Nagel raises. Moreover, 
The argument loses all its force if the facts, which the hypothesis of a divine designer is supposed to explain, can be understood on the basis of a better supported assumption. And indeed, such an alternative explanation is one of the achievements of Darwinian biology. For Darwin showed that one can account for the variety of biological species, as well as for their adaptations to their environments, without invoking a divine creator and acts of special creation. The Darwinian theory explains the diversity of biological species in terms of chance variations in the structure of organisms and of mechanisms of selection which retain those vari variation forms that possess some advantages for survival. The evidence for these assumptions is considerable, and developments subsequent to Darwin have only strengthened the case for a thoroughly naturalistic explanation of the fact of biological adaptation. In any event, this version of the argument from design has nothing to recommend it. So, we might remember the argument from design in a slightly different way. This was the argument that there are two possible explanations for how the world came to be as it is, chance or design. And it couldn't be chance, so it must be design, and this implies a designer, and this designer is God. All right, so if we apply Nagel's objection to this argument, we instead end up with something like this. There are three possible explanations for how the world came to be as it is. Chance, design, and Darwinian biology. It couldn't be chance, so it must be either design or Darwinian biology. The evidence for the assumptions of Darwinian biology is considerable and can account for the variety of biological species as well as for their adaptations to their environment without invoking the divine creator and aspects of special creation. So, Darwinian biology is the best explanation for how the world came to be as it is.